My name's Matthew, I'm the CEO of the CX Machina, the Enterprise Agile Coach. If you're interested in tweeting, I'll leave my handles there and um, let's start. So we're going to talk about couples counselling. We're basically taking patterns from psychology and we look at that. how do we actually treat dysfunction in teams. Now, when often we're, when I talk about teams, we, and we think about their evolution, we think of kind of this kind of model, and that, that's kind of normal, it's kind of what everyone's going to. You know, as long as you don't think of it in, in, in a linear way, we, we don't evolve because of forming, storming, and all that kind of way. Kind of goes to and fro, and right backwards and forwards. But when we think about dysfunction in a team in particular, we think about something slightly different. Dysfunction is actually impaired or abnormal function particularly in relation to unhealthy interpersonal behaviour interaction within groups, between groups, etc. And it was this that I found, found myself when I had to travel from my home in Canberra uh, about three hours uh, to a place called Wollongong. Lots of double letters. Um, there was a team there which wasn't... Um, they were there in Wollongong separate from a whole bunch of their other teams in a scaled, agile environment. Um, and pretty much I was the one that they called on in this environment when teams were going bad. Hands up if, if you've ever experienced a team going bad before. Yeah, is that much fun? No. No. So what kinds of things when a team goes bad, what kinds of things do you normally see? Shutting down. Shutting down. Backstabbing. Backstabbing. What else? Low productivity. Blaming. Yeah, you've been there. <laughs> So, often people turn to Patrick Lencioni, these five dysfunctions of team, when they want to think about what are some ways that I can help my team be better. And he kind of created this nice, nice pyramid, etc. Uh, conflict here, where he goes, yeah, conflict, yeah, demand debate. Now, this is really good, and I don't mind Patrick's stuff, but it is a fable. It is basically his made up idea about how, how teams work. And for me, that's not quite good enough. I'm a science practitioner, I've got a psychology background, and a linguistics background, and what I, look, what I look for, as Dan did this, this morning, I look for the research, I look for the science, because I want something that's repeatable. If I do it with one team and, and put my, my psych hat on and look at a team's behaviour, one team, I want to be able to use that pattern to be able to help another team. If I see certain kinds of behaviours, I want to go, has this worked? If it does, great, is it repeatable? Does it measure what it's intended to measure? So this team, I thought, there's, there's lots of ways, lots of different coaching stances that I could take. I could go in there and try to be their best friend, be their mentor, build trust, build rapport. I might do some training, etc. But I thought, no, look, what I really need to do is to is to adopt a counselor perspective. I need to look at what kinds of what kind of structure is going to help me to resolve and manage that dysfunction. And that means listening and empathising, managing conflict, not resolving it, but managing conflict, and focusing on listening in order to, to try to um, deal with the symptoms of these issues. And my go-to when it comes to looking at dysfunctional uh, interpersonal relationships is uh, Dr. John Gottman. Now this guy has been doing this for decades. Longitudinal studies, 33,000 couples, over 20 years. The stuff that he's, that he's found, stuff that he's, he's found is pan-cultural. It doesn't matter what kind of culture, what kind of background, socioeconomic status, pretty much he can predict with 90% accuracy whether or not a divorce is going to happen in a married couple. And that's both heterosexual um, and um, and same-sex marriages. So this is pretty serious stuff. And he calls the main four factors in terms of when, how, how this, this interpersonal relationship, relationship is going to break down. He calls them the four horsemen. Four horsemen in the apocalypse. And they are content, <laughs> defensiveness, stonewalling, and criticism. So that's where I started with, with this team. I thought, well, what is it? Am I seeing contempt? in the way that the team engages. Now, contempt, as defined by uh, Dr. Gottman, sarcasm, bel belittling, cynicism, hostile humour, uncaring behaviour. And that's what I was seeing. Things like, oh, your testing was good, for one. 
once. Or responses like, oh, well, you just can't take a joke. These are all symptoms of contempt. <coughs> what about defensiveness? Defensiveness is a really interesting thing because it's about not owning the behaviour and basically seeing any response as an attack. And so trying to attack back. And strangely enough, some of the behaviours I was seeing, well, you're not testing fast enough or your code is always broken. So always kind of trying to throw the ball back at someone else as opposed to going, yeah, look, at my, my, my behaviour, the way that I work, it could be better. Or we could be working better. It was all, all defensiveness. But what about stonewalling? Well, stonewalling is all about withdrawal. Withdrawal for, for conflict. And unlike Patrick Poinciani, where he goes, yeah, I'd like to you know, call it out. Um, in cultures like Australia, and a lot of other South, Southeast Asian countries, like, we, we don't like conflict at all. And I'm sure a lot of you don't either. So the kinds of behaviours that, that I was seeing was things like um, when someone would ask a question, kind of getting a non-answer in response. Oh, when, when will this be ready? When, when, will it be, when will it be good? When do you think you'll have an answer for me? Oh, look, seems like that. Right, last one, criticism. Right? This is a verbal attack, personal attack on either your character or even your work. And again, the kinds of behaviours that I was observing, things like it's always your fault, your code is terrible, even though it might have been conscious. So we're seeing a lot of this kind of behaviour. The question is, how do you treat it? How do you treat the symptoms of that? And Dr. Goldman has this great model called the Sound Relationship House, built on two very strong pillars. The first one is trust, and the second one is commitment. Now, one of his colleagues, though, you can never remember that, uh, Dr. Brymore, has actually developed a version of this called the Sound Team House. And all of Gottman's levels, all the ways he talks about good relationships, she's actually created a version of that about teams. Quite, which is very, very interesting research. And it starts off with, look, we need to be able to develop colleague maps, understand positive feedback, respond and engage, understand the nature of perception and reality, managing conflict, career advancement, and shared culture. That's some of these things that I'm going to go through with you today. So first thing, managing conflict over resolving conflict. Strangely enough, about 69% of all conflict in human beings is pretty much perceptual perpetual problems. Yeah. I'm sure you've experienced before you have to the same argument over and over and over again. It doesn't matter whether it's with your partner or with your kids or with team members. 69% of them are probably unable to be resolved. And actually 16% of those actually have hidden agendas. They're actually because all the other things are going on. The thing that you're arguing about isn't actually the thing that's actually the root of the problem. So one of the first patterns that I started to talk with this Scrum Master about was this one because it's not all your fault. In a blame culture, we're very much in, in attack mode. It's all, it's all your fault, your fault, not my fault. And so with, with the Scrum Master, I said, look, let's actually make it safe to state when there is an issue. When you do see an issue, please let me know about it. Let's understand if there are actual perpetual problems going on and what the nature of those are. And we started then to engage team members one on one, not in not in a formal way, but sometimes it was over coffee, sometimes it was going off to lunch, sometimes it was just corridor conversations. But reassuring and affirming, reassuring and affirming that look, we're going to start to be a little bit more open about these kinds of things, not in order to be <coughs> disrupt just destructive and critical. Because what we wanted to understand was that well, we're all we're all actually team here. And your problems are my problems. So it's not all your fault, this is our fault. If we think about the way that um, the toilet production system lean works, it's the system of work. We have a system of people. People do the work. And if there are things that are going wrong, we step back and go, well, 
what is it that we're not doing that's failing the people working in this system? And let's actually think about adjusting the system so it does actually create an environment where we get the best out of people working in it. So that's where we start, thinking more from a system approach. Some of the things that um, I then did, particularly with the product owner and the scrum master, and the, the leaders within this, this team, was to be able, be able to help them understand and recognise aspects of conflict. Now, of course, you're chilling out, you're having a great lunch, kind of you know, low emotional state, I don't know, maybe some of you are excited to, you know, to be here with me. Um, and you know, your prefrontal cortex, the way that you think, it's kind of cruising along, your amygdala, not so much. But in a high emotional environment, when you're actually having conflict, Basically, your prefrontal cortex gets completely overrided by your amygdala. You go into fight or flight mode. This is a physiological and neurological activity that's going on. You're completely rendered speechless. You can, you're not capable of logical thought in this kind of environment. Your BPM goes over 100, and all of those horsemen, contempt, defensiveness, stonewalling, criticism, they all come out. Because basically, because you're not thinking logically, there's no, you've got no mechanism, neurologically speaking, to stop saying all those horrible things that you would probably never say if you were in a low emotional state. So I'd like you to think back to the last time that you kind of lost it. You kind of lost your temper. And I want you to think on a scale of 1 to 10, what was kind of that tipping point? On a scale of 1 to 10. I'd like you to think about how did you actually feel <coughs> at that point? How did you feel? Twelve. Twelve <laughs> sizes. Okay. Now, don't tell me what I'd like you to do. Right. Everyone got kind of an idea when, when they last lost it, as if you know it's good, all right? I'd like you to turn to the person next to you. Or if you need table three, obviously in threes. I'd like you to actually talk about your score and relate the context, who it was with, <laughs> and how you felt. I'm going to give you about five minutes as time box to have that chat. Does it mean it worked? I think it didn't So the term is flooded. Thank you. So um, who'd, um, who'd like to talk, uh, let me know their, their school? Sorry, what? Yeah. Their, your school? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Six. Six? Six. Um, do you think it differs, like your school differs, uh, depending upon the person you're kind of getting angry with? Yeah. Yes? What about the context? Yes? Did anyone have radically different schools? Yes? Yes, I do have different schools at work and at home. Different schools at work and home? <laughs> at work and at home and with different people. Different people as well? Yeah. Do you find that there's probably people that you're a little bit more patient with and you can probably go to about nine or so? <laughs> um, when, when I was um, at a... Um, Friend back in Australia, Bern, is German, and for like just about everyone, his number's like two. <laughs> and it's like, Bern, like, dude, what, what's going on? He went, well, because he's German, but basically, it's, you know, by the time he gets, gets to two, it just feels that it's okay just to say whatever's all kind of on his mind. <laughs> 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 but like, but, but your number's going to be different depending on, on a whole range of things. And it's those things to kind of be aware of when, when we think about when we get into a situation where we can feel ourselves kind of the anger kind of starting to stir, starting to stir you kind of might get a bit fidgety and go, Ugh. but remember those feelings. And importantly, be really, really aware. So this is Amy Pat's called Calm the Farm. Yeah. Um, a friend, friend of mine, that's what her son says to her when, when she kind of gets in a bit of a flooded state. He goes, Mum, just calm the farm. But like, if, if you're in, if you're in, in, um, in an engagement with, with someone, and, um, and you can kind of start to feel yourself get, getting flooded. Say the other person calm down. <laughs> like, like, what they actually hear is like, what? Can't, can't have feelings. Like, are you saying that I'm overreacting? Or like, oh, shut up, you're overreacting. Well, well my, my feelings and feelings are, aren't they worth listening to? Um, or, or, or this one, like, I, I know how you feel. When, when you say that, what, what the other person hears is, uh, you're saying, like, I'm getting it, so I stop talking to you. Maybe that's what you mean, actually. That's probably <laughs> what you mean. Like, sometimes in, 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 a, in a situation where we're trying to show empathy, but the other person is being flooded, 
This is what they hear, because they're not thinking logically and rationally. <coughs> so the pattern that I introduced to, to this, this poor team, um, we started to talk about uh, very similar exercises that we've just done around, well, around the term flooded. And I encouraged them to call it out, like if they felt that they were being flooded, I said, look, it's okay, and we should all accept that you're allowed to say, I feel flooded. Um, and for them then, it was the trigger word for them then to go and um, what is called um, self-soothing. It really just, just means um, set, set a time box, because you don't want to go away, because you know, we're having an argument, everything's getting in, and you go, I feel flooded. If I go away, like suddenly you feel a bit abandoned. Oh, like we were having a discussion, like it was really meaningful, but unfortunately you know, we both kind of got kind of over emotional. So it's a time box, and that time box is actually the, the time to go away, so soon and come back. So it might be you walk around the block. You know, the idea obviously isn't to think about, like, oh, David, David, if I had to, had to said that, then I would have just got you, and yeah. It's, so it's not oh, to go away and not murder. It's to go away, just, just free your mind, calm down, stop, get to a point where, where BPM is kind of low. Um, and so you can come back and engage in a much more rational way where your prefrontal cortex is actually engaged. You can think logically again. Okay. Um, so when, when you come back, you're allowed to complain, but not blame. And the difference is, but complaining isn't saying, look, I feel left out, lots of my words. But criticism would be, well, you never asked me. And often it's kind of with a finger, you. So think about, use I words. Describe what happened, but don't have your own judge. So just the facts. What happened, particularly from your perspective. And you can do that quite easily if you move, move the sense to just I, can you know. Uh, be quite appreciative, and importantly, don't store things up. Don't bottle it up. But you're, now that your amygdala is kind of playing back seat now, you talk about it in a much more rational way. Really, really happy. I'm used in a car. Sometimes I'm like, come to America, driving along, the person next to me is like, oh, okay, let's just not come down. You know, I, I sense that you flooded. How about we put some, some music? So that's fine. So what happens though in a heated exchange and in a conflict that's actually really quite bad? How do you actually come back from that? And so for a lot of years we were looking at the repair attempt itself. How do people try to make it fit? You know, like the repair attempt might be, gee, I don't think either one of us is really listening to the other right now. Maybe we should try again. Or a repair attempt might be, uh, you know, this isn't this isn't really what we're supposed to be talking about. We're getting off on a tangent. Or a repair attempt might be, I need a break. Or a repair attempt might be, you know, I'm sorry. I really, I really wish I hadn't said that. And we were looking at the repair attempt and how it, was, how it was said, and we found that we could not predict the effectiveness of repair from the nature of the repair attempt. And in fact, some people were making the repair attempts in a beautiful way, it could have been written by a social worker, and, you know, and, and it, was, it was failing. And other people were making repair attempts in this real clumsy way, and it was successful. So for years we were looking at what makes repair attempts effective, and we didn't find any answers until we started looking at the person receiving the repair team, right? And what made the difference was really how much emotional money in the bank they had with that person. In other words, my repair attempt with Julie is gonna work well if I've really been a good friend to her, especially lately. If I've been really putting emotional deposits in the bank account that we have. And I've been, you know, I've been doing nice things, I've been kind, you know, I've been understanding, you know, I've been there for her when she needs me, all those kinds of things. That determines whether she's going to accept my repair team. So that's repair teams. What about trust? What kind of factor does trust play in government's house? Importantly, in order to be able to establish a mechanism to counter the four horsemen. How do you build trust? Again, you can turn to research because research is going to tell you specifically what it is that increases this trust metric. 
turns out that trust is built in very small moments, which I call sliding door moments, after the movie Sliding Doors. Because in any interaction, there's a possibility of connection with our partner or turning away from our partner. Let me give an example of that from my own relationship. So one night, I was really wanting to finish a mystery novel. I, I thought I knew who the killer was, but I wanted to really find out. So I put the novel on my bedside, and I walked in to the bathroom. And before I even got into the bathroom, I looked at my wife's face in the mirror, and she looked sad, brushing her hair. So there was a sliding door moment. I had a choice. I could kind of sneak out of the bathroom and think, you know, I don't want to deal with her sadness, but I want to read my novel. Now, that really wouldn't define our relationship, I think, you know, but <clears throat> Because I'm a sensitive researcher of relationships, I decided to go into the bathroom. I took the brush from her hair, and I said, what's the matter, baby? She told me why she was sad. Now, that moment, I was building trust. I was there for her. Right? I was connecting with her. Rather than choosing, think only about what I wanted. These are the moments that we discover that build trust. Now, one such moment is not that important, but if you're always choosing to turn away, then trust erodes in the relationship, very gradually, very slowly. So some happens to apply. Looking for sliding door moments is key. The small moments help to build trust. And they, can, they often appear as bids. So a bid for something like, oh, I don't think that I can do this myself, or a bid for attention. So, oh, yeah, I was looking at this automated test script. Um, could come out and look at it. Or what about bid for enthusiasm? Someone saying, oh, I've got some ideas for your retrospective pattern. Bids for extended conversation, bids for play. So, as you know, Matthew, the, the coach, always going and doing things to they come on board just to see if they notice. Yes, um, <laughs> I, I tend to do that. Um, bid, bids for humor. So, if someone's seen a funny video that they want to share, or even a big bids for affection. So someone simply doing you know, a high five or wanting a fist bump, that's a sliding door lane. And a bid is an opportunity to go, and, and it's important to be able to recognize them. Because these are opportunities to kind of build up that bank account. Or bids for emotional support, someone tends to be quite worried, bid for self disclosure. So, you know, oh, uh, what, you know, what happened to you when you, because you left early? So have a look, look at the bids. Another thing to think about in terms of trust, what's the relationship between trust and psychological safety? And it's uh, Edmund's research, and Edmund's research, if you're familiar with this, is, um, is pretty clear. The, there's a whole range of things that help to build psychological safety. And as psychological safety gets stronger, then things like see, uh, people seeking feedback, seeking help, actually speaking up when they have concerns, Trust plays a significant part in that, but not the only one. And saying and demanding of, uh, of trust, saying, oh, let's talk about trust, and Yemen says, says that there's that, just that conversation itself doesn't lead to trust. It doesn't build psychological safety. But it's seeing those opportunities for engagement and taking the opportunity to invest in them. So that's trust. Positive feedback. Okay, so five to one ratio is your golden one to try to achieve. Try to find mechanisms to build positive conversations. <coughs> Excuse me. And be aware that about 0.8 to 1, 0.8 to 1 dysfunctional relationships have 0.8 to 1 positive to negative conversations. Listen to the conversation. Not only watch for the behaviour and watch for those four horsemen. We can listen to the conversations. And if there's, if there's problems, then you know, here are some patterns of news. And this was actually the first retrospective pattern after you know, driving, driving down the lawn drive um, that I did with the team. I got them all to write down a post it note for every other um, member of the team and actually say, reflect on them on the screen and so think about and write down something that they appreciated that that person did. And I also did that, I'd spent the week with them. And then they all went in a little box, and I pulled one out, and I read it out. And the 
and, and say one big for Aaron, it's like, oh, Aaron, I really love the way that you were able to have that conversation with the business because that really cleared up for us some of the, the scope boundaries of this particular item of that book. Um, and so I would then give that post-it note to Aaron and the box of all the other post-it notes. And it's Aaron's job then to pull, pull the post-it note out. And if he finds that these, that it's one that he's written, because all these must have been on the tremendous, then he, he puts his own ones back until he finds one for another team member. And so he went round until everyone had a post-it note. And I then said, take that post-it note and stick it to you with the sighting monitor for the rest of the sprint to remind you of what you've given to the team and also what the team appreciates in the work that you've done. That retrospective output pattern only took us 20 minutes. That was all we needed to start to kind of rebuild those positive communications over here. Um, this is actually Peter's Wall from um, a big collaborative planning activity one of my consultants did last week. And this was kind of there and on the last day, we were towards the end, everyone started to come up and put things up there. But it was a great, great way to remind everyone um, of individual things that people had done over the two days that really helped to create transparency. This kid has good impact. Right, colleague maps. Really about, again, so we've got uh, ones about communication, we've got ones for flooding. How do we actually create anything? And one of the patterns I like to use is personal maps, particularly when we've got new team members coming into a team, um, or I'm starting a new team. So um, I'll, often I'll do a team canvas, but it'll start off as a personal map. This is one actually, you see there, it's me. This one actually comes from a uh, one that I did with um, a team in Melbourne not too long ago. And really it's just about put yourself in the middle, standardise your category, so you're going to use home, uh, work, education, values, family, uh, hobbies. Everyone does one, then they share the map, and they take, take turns telling stories. And it's a really, really simple way, really simple activity. And in order to be able to start to actually see this, look at other people and understand them from a human perspective. Another one, candy love. So you get all your MMs, stick them in a big jar, pull one out, and based on the one you pull out, that colour represents a certain thing you've got to do. So red, pull the red MM out, tell us one thing about um, that you love about your joy. If it's yellow, uh, tell us about a life goal you're working on. If it's green, well, what about your favourite book or movie? Because you know, everyone has hobbies. And particularly in a team that's kind of suffering from dysfunction, suffering from problems, being able to pull these, these things out um, and providing them an opportunity to actually have a discussion that's not about work can help to create some nice distance. Uh, another one, um, would you rather? Now, going through Goblin stuff, there's a blog that's really quite amazing. There was this one about 25 fun questions to ask your spouse. A little bit not safe for work to turn your work into a retrospective pattern. But um, <laughs> things like, um, you know, would you rather play a board game or watch a movie? Would you rather be a movie star or a famous musician? Would you rather go into the past and meet your ancestors or go into the future and meet your great great grandchildren? And future perspective, this is one of my faves. You know, everyone thinking about, well, this is where we are now. Really, what do we want to be as a team in the future? Um, I typically like to use the, the um, categories of culture, behaviour and enablers, so what's going to help us get there. Um, and then the one, two, four, all pattern from the brain structures to populate it. Very, very simple. So individual brainstorming, buddy up, share what you've got, group of four, and then up into the wall. That's fine. That's a good spec. Okay, let's wrap up. So after about six months, I came back about every two weeks. Mm -hmm. And I'm um, listening to Dan Pink this morning, strangely enough, have a guess at the time when I came back at the end? Yes. Pretty much back, I fly, I drive down, come on Sunday, um, there, uh, they'd end their spring about Tuesday, so I think they the end of their spring, have conversations, you're looking out for behaviour, you're listening to what we're going to hear 
Um, unfortunately, after six months, the team didn't kill each other, which was kind of nice. Um, they learned how to use their sliding door moments and recognize bids, which was really, really lovely. Um, and their communication improved quite significantly. Like six months. Yeah, it took time. And I think one of the things that they appreciated ultimately was because um, they were isolated from all these other teams and I made the effort come down and say, look, this is a problem that we're going to work together. Um, and that helped them. It really, really did. A lot of those, those behaviours that we saw, we saw in the Horse Horsemen, they pretty much, by six months, most of them had gone. Now, I find this quite ironic that you know, we say, well, you know, some of the reasons why we want Agile in our lives, you know, well, we want to be able to adapt to change. But after 10 years of versions one, version one's a state of agile survey, it's always about half of these initiatives fail because of people and culture problems. So you have this problem with people, even if they change, even though we're in the business of change. So some things I want you to take away from today. Number one, look for the research. Look for the data. Be mindful that you can't resolve most conflict, mm -hmm. but you can manage it. Manage it being up by being able to understand some of those trigger words that you know, when people are flooded, what they're really here. Understanding the nature of, of being flooded. Understanding like, what does that really feel like? And knowing that in yourself that that's the point in time where you go, I'm, I'm flooded, you know, let's take a time out, you know, let's come back to it in 10 minutes. But importantly, I think a lot of us forget, and certainly my Scrum Master folks have got in this team, that Scrum actually says when we get to a retrospective, what should we do? Well, we should actually inspect the sprint in relation to people and relationships, as well as process and tools. But these are things that as coaches, as trainers, as people who love Scrum, this is something that sometimes gets left out. And this is something that for this team, to help them with their dysfunction, I focus back on that, back on the fact that we're people that help them get out of control. Thank you very much. <laughs>